Uh, the theme of this uh, video lesson is the Heckscher Ulin model of international trade. And I have here taken the uh, black and white photos of uh, Professor Heckscher and, and Dr. Ulin. So let me first start with a little bit background of, of, uh, of this, uh, this um, model. So this Heckscher Ulin model is, is a general equilibrium model which was developed by Eli Heckscher and, and Bertil Ullin at the Stockholm School of Economics in, in Sweden. And uh, Professor Heckscher published this, uh, uh, this idea first in a paper written in Swedish in, in 1919. But uh, at that time, the paper didn't really catch a lot of uh, attention, partly also because Professor Heckscher published uh, a lot of papers at that time uh, but then it was uh, Heckscher student uh, Bertil Ullin who, who developed the model further and wrote his uh, doctoral dissertation on the topic that was published five years later in 1924. And the dissertation was also, also in Swedish. And it took about uh, almost 10 years until Ullin then published in 1933 a book titled Interregional and International Trade uh, uh, published by Harvard University Press, and then this uh, English publication then finally started to spread this uh, this uh, model to a, to a wider uh, economic audience. And by 1977, the the model was so so well established and uh, and uh, received that uh, Bertil Ullin received Nobel Prize uh, for for particularly for this uh, this development. So that also indicates that it's very, very highly, highly appreciated and uh, important uh, contribution. So let's look in a little bit in more detail about this model. So I don't go to the technicalities of, of this kind of uh, general equilibrium model, but uh, we can think about it as this two times two times two model, because uh, basically in the model, uh, we have two countries, A and B, Similar to to David Ricardo's, we, David Ricardo had England and Portugal, but uh, now we have just more abstract A and A and B. Could be Finland and Sweden, for example. Then we have two goods again, food, food and clothes, which are often used in this type of examples. And uh, let's assume that the consumers in both countries have uh, identical preferences on on food and clothes. So I will use F for food and C for clothes. So we have two countries, two goods, and then we also have two factors of production, label L and capital K. And here comes the essential difference between the countries. We, we assume that countries have different uh, endowments of labor and capital. So one of the countries can have uh, can be more more have have bigger capital stock, and another country might have a larger labor force. Okay, and this then then drives the specialization. And let's suppose also that production functions, so in some sense production technologies, are the same for both, both countries. So both countries have the same production function F of L and K. And we also assume that production functions exhibit constant returns to scale. So you can you can scale up and down the, the production. If you if you increase both labor and capital by some factor S, then output increases also by factor S. And finally, in the model, we don't have any transport costs or tariffs or other, other barriers of trade. So there is a frictionless uh, trade between these uh, two countries, at least in, in principle. Okay. So let me illustrate the model shortly, but, but let me first come to the main, main uh, uh, result, which is known as the heckscher ollin theorem, which states that uh, the country that is abundant in a factor exports the good whose production is intensive in that factor. So in other words, if a country is abundant in, in capital input, uh, then it exports goods that are, are capital intensive. Conversely, if, if a country is abundant in labor, then it exports more labor intensive goods. This is what the heckscher ullin theorem predicts. So notice that these two countries are otherwise identical. So there is no difference in the in the consumer preferences. There's no difference in the technology. It is just this uh, endowment of labor and capital that then then uh, then is differs 
across these two countries. So then let's get to, to some, some figures. So I, I skipped the mathematics, but I will, I will try to give you the intuition. And remember from the previous uh, lesson where we had this uh, specific factors model that we had this kind of uh, um, production possibility frontier that is, it is not linear, but it is curved away from the origin. And, uh, and this is when, when, we, when we took this kind of capital input into account. So now let's have two countries in the similar figure. And I took this kind of, uh, oh, sorry. So here is still this kind of, uh, kind of um, before going to that, then let's, let's think of uh, that we have this price line in introduced also to this, uh, to this kind of um, um, a production possibility frontier. So that um, if, if these this, uh, straight lines then indicate that they are depending on price of uh, food and price of clothes, we can think about some kind of world market prices that that, that indicate the slope. Uh, then that would kind of indicate whether where the country can can uh, can can trade. So now let's take this these two countries to this kind of figure. It might look a little bit scary, but uh, but let me walk you through carefully. So I took this example from the Wikipedia article of the of the Hexerulean model. So remember that these countries A and B, they differ in terms of their endowments. So here is country A is indicated on, the, on this. So suppose consider the production possibility frontier of country, country A. And it is this, uh, this kind of curve from GA1 and GA2. So this, this lower, lower part is country A. And then we have also country B is this uh, another country. So remember that this is not because the production functions are different. The difference comes from the fact that there's endowments of labor and capital are, are different. So without the trade, then, then uh, country A would operate in this point AA. So it would, would produce uh, it would choose something where this gets to the highest uh, indifference curve and choose this this point and then for country b then then this initial um allocation of production would would lead to a b so this is what uh, what country b would then produce in the absence of trade and notice now this these tangent lines these gray lines in for b and a they are different, so so there would be there would be price differences in this in this uh, uh, food and clothes, so that uh, so that that uh, the prices differ in these two countries in the in the absence of trade. If there would be like a huge uh, huge tariffs or the transport costs were were extremely high. So then let's consider the possibility. What happens when when we have uh, uh, when we open up for trade, for example, we, we lower the, the tariffs or, or the transport costs uh, decrease. So if, if the countries can trade, then the new, new situation is characterized by the C, C, A, C, B. So because both countries have, consumers in both countries have identical preferences, so they also uh, prefer to get the same consumption basket and notice that the ca cb is uh, is outside of the production possibility sets of both uh, both countries so how do the countries get to this point c uh, so this is because then countries can specialize more in this factor where they are more abundant and notice that if you think of first about country a country a is more uh, more abundant in uh, in a factor that uh, that uh, helps to produce uh, good number one. So if good one is capital intensive, then country A has has larger endowment of capital. So uh, with trade, then country moves from AA to PA. So it increases its capital intensive production and produces PA, and then it trades with country B. Whereas then country B would move from uh, a, B to P, B, so it would uh, specialize more to the labor-intensive good and then export 
So, so when we take into account these possibilities that uh, that uh, that it can export this uh, this surplus of of uh, of good that it doesn't produce, then both countries can move their consumption to to CA. So this is the intuition of the of the Hexer Hexer Ullin model. So I repeat that uh, that this these orange indifference curves they are the same for both countries because both countries have identical consumer preferences and uh, and therefore the only difference is from these endowments of labor and capital and uh, the hexer ullin theorem would predict that countries specialize more in the production of the good where they are, they are they are they are have have larger endowments so it's kind of analog analog to this uh, uh, ricardo's um, um, theory of comparative advantage, but now the comparative advantage in this hexer ullin model, it comes from these uh, factor endowments. And notice that uh, in this example also, countries do not specialize completely. They specialize a little bit more than they would uh, otherwise in the absence of trade, but they do not specialize completely. So neither country goes to this uh, uh, corner solution where that only produces one of the goods. So both, both countries produce both food and clothes, but uh, but uh, but then they increase the production of the of the this kind of exporting goods where they have a, have a either either capital intensive or, or labor intensive good uh, if they depending on what this kind of factor endowments they have. So this kind of kind of model then can can explain why why countries uh, do not ha- exhibit such kind of extreme specialization as the as the Ricardian theory of comparative advantage would suggest, and it adds some uh, additional, uh, more, more realistic elements to this to this trade theory, but still maintains the essential aspects of this uh, Ricardian theory of comparative advantage. So I will discuss some implications of the Hexer-Ullin model in the in the next lesson. See you then.